Um, I'm also happy to be here and, and thank you, Lucinda, for inviting us uh, here to speak and to celebrate the 10th year, 10th uh, yeah, uh, anniversary of the Thessaloniki agenda, the Thessaloniki agreement, and actually the start of what. Uh, um, was the most important process for the Western Balkans in the last uh, several decades. Um, at that time, I was um, I interrupted my work career and uh, I was studying. I did my master in Athens, so I spent the uh, 2002 and 2003 in um, Greece while Alexandra was uh, working on the Thessaloniki paper in uh, uh, in the north of Greece. I was in Athens, following the news and following what the and how the the, the actual European Union is going to devise a sort of a mechanism for the Western Balkans at that time, um, and I think I remember the Evora meeting before that in, on, uh, of the European Council, uh, the, uh, the very approach was tailored, and um, us in the Western Balkans, we were just very keen to see how uh, the Zagreb meeting and also the Thessaloniki meeting is going to give birth to a sort of a new approach of the European Union towards what the, uh, and how the Western Balkans should approach the European Union. Now, 10 years after, after the, the events, we could say that there is um, there are some mixed feelings on the progress. There is there are some mixed feelings on how the country has actually managed to um, um, to use the opportunities. Um, the Thessaloniki actually um, uh, colored or actually influenced most of our work careers of the people who worked in the European or who still work on the European uh, integration uh, agenda. Uh, along with the Stabilization Association uh, process, Stabilization Association agreements, also IPA, and all those words that became very important for everyday work of uh, anyone who works actually on the European affairs. Um, I'm also glad to be here to uh, to to, um, uh, to be actually talking to not just the Western Balkans countries but also the member states because as we could hear also how the uh, Irish did their negotiations in uh, what kind of time span and, and how many meetings, if I, if I rem uh, remember correctly, eight chapters, 10 ministerial and 29 civil servants meetings. As the commissioner said, we already had some 100 meetings on chapters 23, 24, and not to tell you about the rest of the 33 chapters that we are going to work in the next uh, uh, months and years. Um, I wanted to give you a sort of, um, so we actually, we fulfilled the Irish quota, now we have to, uh, to start on our own, on, 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 uh, on, the, on the different, um, actually, um, uh, nature of the negotiating process, of the different nature of integration and enlargement. As you know, the, uh, lots of things changed. The Croatian entry and the Croatian negotiating process was a sort of, a, I would say, the last modified um, enlargement approach that characterized the 90s and the, and the years after 2000. Um, I believe that Montenegro is the opening um, country or the first country opening the face of a new negotiating waves and new enlargement uh, approach to things. As you know, we talked a lot about the, the new approach and what the new approach brings and how it actually influences the rest of the uh, chapters and the actually the pace that the country makes. And um, I would say that the, uh, the very uh, substance of the negotiations of the integration has changed in the sense that now many things, uh, uh, the focus actually turned to many things that were not so important in the previous enlargements. Now we talk more about the substance, we talk more about the practical elements, we talk more about the delivery. And I believe that the delivery has become the word of the of the of the, of the uh, important for any uh, anyone working on the European agenda in uh, in the candidate countries or uh, potential candidates, uh, meaning that um, I can push forward for the through my negotiating structure back home in Montenegro to have the legislation amendments to to uh, adopt the laws and to have the, the legislative framework but if the country cannot show to be able to deliver on the key issues such as the rule of law on the economic performance on the financial scrutiny and the financial discipline then the very process will uh, either stagnate or regress um, and therefore, the integration or the enlargement, um, um, de depending on the point of view from which you look at the process, uh, has become very much different. Um, um, now, a year and a half after Montenegro actually opened accession nego negotiations uh, with the so-called uh, specific clause that we got through the December Council uh, on opening actually talks on 23, 24, and then getting the green light to open the rest of the chapters, 
I can say that the, um, uh, we, we again have a sort of a mixed feelings. Um, um, in the previous year and a half, I talked a lot with the Icelanders, for example, because we could, that was the only country that we could share our experience when it comes to specific negotiating techniques or when it comes to the um, uh, issues such as what we should take care on uh, when it comes to the screening or how you actually, what you do after you do the screening or what uh, actually to focus on and so on and so on. No matter how Iceland was far away and how different their agenda was when it comes to the really the problematic areas that they are negotiating in comparison to us. Uh, we talk to the Turks a lot uh, when it comes to their positioning and, and how they see the process. Um, uh, we also went uh, a lot to Zagreb. Uh, we got the uh, chief negotiator from Croatia coming uh, to Montenegro. I talked to him regularly in Brussels. And we tried really to um, uh, circle around and uh, um, uh, all the friends and all the possible partners within the negotiations to see how the things change and how to adapt to the new circumstances and how actually to be able to proceed um, in, the, in the process. Now, uh, 2013, this year has uh, marked or has been marked by two big events. One is the Croat entry, the other one is uh, possibly the uh, opening uh, accession talks with Serbia. So these two countries, the biggest two countries of the region, um, that are, uh, and, and, and to be frank, that are actually coloring the, the, the pace of the rest of the region, um, and their success is key for the rest of the countries. I might, I, I might have liked to be uh, like Iceland and Ireland, somewhere in the in the seas and not surrounded by the neighbors, but that's not the case. Montenegro is a part of the region. It's heavily influenced by what's happening in Serbia, in what's happening in Kosovo, what's happening in Bosnia Herzegovina, and in Croatia. And therefore, the Croatian entry in a, in a month or so will have a, a huge symbolic impact. That would be the first time that the land border of the EU comes to the Montenegrin land border. That would be the first time that one of the Western Balkan countries actually, the real Western Balkan country, joins the European Union. And, um, and therefore, we are planning a sort of a celebration from our side of the border on the 1st of July to congratulate Croatia on entering the European Union. You would agree that this, for those who know, happens in the area that was a part of the, our, 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 our land where the conflict um, came about in 1991. And uh, I would say that the, this is clearly a kind of a show, a kind of a symbolic value for the region, showing that we are actually saluting the Croat entry and we look forward to joining them in the union of the, of the nations of the European uh, Union. Therefore, the, um, the, uh, the very situation in the region and where we stand now is, uh, as uh, many of the speakers said today, is very different. You cannot in many occasions share your experience with the rest of the countries because unlike with the big bag enlargement, we cannot go to Sarajevo or to Belgrade to tell them, okay, we are doing this, how did you do this and what should we focus in chapter 13 or chapter 15 on uh, our European agenda. Um, uh, this will stay for some time like that. Even when Serbia opens accession talks in some months, uh, they will have to go through the screening and finalize everything before they, they really start working on specific chapters. And now we work and we go through the uh, new approach. We work on uh, rule of law chapters, and we are the first one developing the sort of, um, a sort of action plans that will be a very detailed, very elaborate steps, a kind of a stream of steps or actions that the country is going to take in the next five years when it comes to the rule of law area and to be the special focus on organized crime and corruption. And uh, therefore, the, it's not too easy to be the first one doing things. It's not easy to be the first country where, where so much focus is or more, so much uh, spotlight is put on, on a country doing something which should also serve as a kind of a basis or as kind of a model for the rest of the Western Balkans countries once they start accession talks and use the model that uh, we are uh, building up now. And therefore, uh, we are in a kind of a flux, in a kind of a hectic dynamic on creating the action plans, which already have some 500 pages in total of um, uh, activities that will mark the, uh, the country's progress when it comes to rule of law in the next years, but also that will um, actually provide for a good monitoring mechanism that would show that the country in the uh, negotiating phase, in the pre-accession phase, can show that it has attained the standards that um, are needed for the uh, entering the European Union without any burden of uh, entering it without uh, finishing the job or doing everything it could uh, 
have done in the process of, uh, of negotiations. Um, the rest of the chapters has its own life, as you know, um, um, much or less the same as the and in the previous enlargements. But also the substance or the, let's say, focus has changed because now we look much more into the delivery. It's not just about uh, changing the transport legislation uh, um, or uh, looking into the uh, country's strategic approach to, let's say, economy or uh, the trans-European networks, but it's also more about uh, seeing what the country can contribute and how, how the country can uh, behave once it becomes a matter, member state. And therefore, I believe that the enlargement package uh, um, uh, from last year, December um, um, uh, 2012 was a very crucial package because it talked for the first time, or it talked very, uh, very, very importantly about the need to get the member states uh, together at the same table with the candidates and the potential candidates to discuss the European policies. So it's not just enough to have a, a sort of a, a negotiating agenda, but also to get the, the, the candidates and potential candidates involved in the European policies. Because once we become the uh, members of the European Union, we would need to be ready for what the European policy strategic approach is and so on and so on. And therefore, the uh, Southeast European 2020 strategy is a kind of a key tool of getting the Southeast European or Western Balkans countries within the wider framework of Europe 2020 strategy. And therefore, the uh, mechanisms and the um, uh, tools that the European Union is using in uh, building up on uh, competitiveness or fighting uh, unemployment is um, a kind of a thing that the, the also the Western Balkan countries have to be in and to understand even before they join or open accession talks because this is the way you do. You, you actually have to do the things even before you join because now the process is taking a much longer time than it used to before. And uh, we need to actually start early in the phase also in um, thinking strategically, visionary, and also thinking about the position your country or our countries have to take once we join the European Union. We have, um, um, you know, one of the favorite questions by the, um, by the journalists is, or the media is when we are going to join, when, the Mont when Montenegro is going to finish the process. And, the Croat chief negotiator taught me um, one of the first one of the first lessons actually he gave me in the, a year and a half ago was um, never to tell about the dates, never to talk about the deadlines because that's the uh, kind of a trap with which you never know when um, uh, you're going to end up. You see now Croats uh, have fought for lots of transitional periods that already expired even before Croatia joined the European Union. So your, our ideas and our plans have not to co uh, does not have, do not have to coincide immediately with, with what the, the plans of the European Union um, are when it comes to the um, um, integration or the enlargement, or what the real situation in the, on the ground is. Um, now when we fin finalize the screening, and it will be in a month that we finish the whole screening, we'll have a much better picture of what or where the country stands and how to proceed in the next years to develop uh, very elaborate also plans on what to do in, in each separate chapter and how the country can progress. This will be done according um, uh, to, to also the experience that we have accumulated from other countries to see how the rest of the countries planned uh, their legislation changes, but also how the and 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 how the country's pace can catch up with what the uh, the needs are. You know that we live in the um, crisis environment. You know that this influences very heavily the also the reform agendas and also the integration agendas of every country, and therefore. Um, uh, it's, uh, I, b I believe that uh, nowadays the, uh, the countries within the enlargement process have a um, very hard task. First of all, to combat the, the crisis, the economic crisis, uh, to combat with the growing feeling of the enlargement fatigue, Sorry, uh, and also with the feeling that the um, uh, there is not, not not so much focus of the Western Bo of the European Union in the Western Balkans. That there is not so much of the uh, real involvement like it used to be uh, five years ago, ten years ago, when uh, really the Western Balkans was so much in the focus of the of the uh, European capitals. 
Um, and lots of people do not understand that it's because the, the, the situation calmed down, that in many countries, really people turn to living and uh, bettering their standards of living and, 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 and doing the normal things rather than provoking instability or, or uh, security issues. But these are all um, a kind of questions and kind of um, uh, indicators that have to be taken into account in order to be able to understand where the country and how the countries are going to progress in the next decade. I would um, just end up with, um, with um, a kind of a quote and um, a kind of an example. Uh, why I feel that the integration process is really doing a miracle in the, in the um, uh, candidates and potential candidates. Uh, you know, in uh, 1687, um, uh, there was a big battle of the Venetian um, um, Armada against the uh, Ottomans, uh, fighting to get the, um, um, uh, the whole of the Montenegrin coastline under the Venetian rule. At that time, the Venetian negotiator envoy in Montenegro was talking to the um, uh, let's say the spiritual leaders of the of the Montenegrins, and um, uh, and, and and the bishop told him, you know how Montenegrins are; they're ready. Um, when it comes to bribe, they're ready to jump into the sea and drown just to get it. So you see, the perception of being um, easily bribed, of corrupt, and things that um, uh, actually are a sort of a, um, um, a kind of a stereotype, stereotypical for the region, still persists. Persist. I would say that the only way how we can actually fight these perceptions and stereotypes is really to work together and to use the process, to use the enlargement process and actually to change the countries and, 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 and actually to be able to say after several years like we did with it or you did with Croatia, to be able to say, look, the integration did a miracle. It changed the country, it helped it become a, a EU member, but also it changed it within. And therefore, um, I believe that the uh, current process, the current state that Montenegro is and the rest of the countries will be when they start accession talks is something of um, a specific period in, um, in the lifetime of any country which is um, a kind of thing that does not happen very often. Uh, so we, we want to use it, we want to utilize it for the best of the citizens, but also to show that uh, we need to work together and also to um, actually show that the enlargement policy as it has been mentioned many times, is one of the most successful policies of the EU. Thank you. Thank you.